the session will be a Q and A and a small introduction. Yes, yes, it is. Uh, this is very weird. Uh, this was a last minute thing. They they needed a a, 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 a fallback, and uh, I'm the fallback. Sorry. Uh, it's like, but uh, so what this talk is going to be a little bit different. It's like it's not um, like a standard Q and A kind of thing. It's like a lot of people in this community don't have really. They don't want to question people. They don't want to get out there. They don't want to put themselves out because they're thinking, well, I don't want anybody to like slam me. But I've got questions about this community. I've got questions about this industry. I've got questions about life. So what I do is, and I'm not a famous hacker. I'm not like a, a very great hacker. It's like I do what I do. But I've got a lot of experience. It's like a lot of it's bad. <laughs> it's like, but it teaches you lessons. So I am very firmly believe in uh, the, the saying, uh, a smart man learns from his mistakes, a wiser one learns from someone else. So I'm not always smart, but I want to help you be wise. So uh, I'm very, I don't filter, so be careful. Uh, I've had people try to trip me up and ask me a question they didn't think I was going to answer. They were surprised, uh, and not always the great way. So uh, I don't, I literally don't care. It's like I'm not, I get paid to lie for a living. I don't do it for free. So I'm going to tell you what I think. It's like, and that's just all there is to it. And so I'm going to start at, I'm going to have people ask questions. There's people in the ready to, to, to get, uh, to ask a question. And then I'm going to answer it. I'm just going to answer it the way that I would answer it. And also I know people hate giving things, uh, you know, uh, talking questions. So I got swag to bribe you with. Uh, it's like, so uh, thanks for DEF CON for that, for helping me out. And also, if no one still comes up with a question, that's okay. Because I will randomly select people from the audience to come up with a question for me. So it's a win-win either way. And, and, and people think I'm joking about that. I never joke about that. It's like they always think so, but then they always find out, you know, oops. So let's have a question. Hold on, hold on, say, uh, say it a little bit louder so it's like everybody can hear it. It's like, because it's like, this is for everybody. Okay, uh, what were your most expensive fuck ups? What are the most famous hackers? No, expensive. Expensive? Fuck ups. Oh, expensive. Oh, uh, yeah, I've screwed up a lot. Um, what was my most expensive one? Hmm. I think 2020. Uh, it's like, are, are you talking about, are you talking about like professionally or just in life? Oh, professionally. Okay, good. Then we won't talk about, we'll skip 2020 then. <laughs> I think everybody's happy about that as well, right? It's like, uh, but I will tell you this, depression is not a good time to be on Amazon. I'll leave it at that. Okay. okay. It's like, but, um, I think professionally, um, I'm trying to think it's like my most, I think one of my biggest screw ups was when I was first starting uh, and I was trying to do uh, pen testing, network vulnerability stuff, I wasn't red teaming, I wasn't doing anything like really cool. I was scanning networks, I was doing, uh, using some tools and uh, doing vulnerability assessments for people which are totally different than uh, a lot of other things. There's, a, uh, there's levels. And I ran InMap on a network because you know, that's what we do. We do what we do and so you run InMap and uh, about an hour later, the client was coming to me like, uh, what were y'all doing? Are y'all doing anything? I'm like, no, no, we're, we're all over on this part now. We're fine. And he's like, are you sure? Because it's like, we, our, one of our uh, Cisco routers is dead. And I'm like, well, Cisco. But, but that wasn't a good enough excuse. <laughs> so it turns out that I totally destroyed their, uh, one of their pieces of equipment. Uh, like, oops, my bad, uh, but, um, so I didn't get anything else after that. I didn't get them as a client again, but, uh, but yeah, this was like over 15 years ago. Yeah, it was one of my first ones. It was not good, uh, and uh, now I'm very more selective when I'm doing scanning and when I'm going into to things like that. Any other questions? Yes, there's one in the very back. Just wait, just wait for the mic real quick. That's also to stall for time because, you know, I, uh, I got to fill up the whole time. So, oh, wait, hold on. I, I pointed to the guy in the, in the blue shirt. Oh, oh it's got to go around. It's like. 
And, it, and if you come up to me afterwards, it's like I will uh, give you your swag. But I, I have ADHD, so it's like I do not uh, remember very well. So uh, I, I, you have to like make sure you get me. Or I'll be like, oh, really? That happened? It's like, so object permanence sucks. Um, what is the most uh, underrated uh, things, hacker things, like the title? W what was the other thing? What is the most underrated act or oh, the hacker thing? The most underrated hacker thing, I think, is, um, that's a good question. Because there's quite a few, it's like, I think the underrated uh, hacker thing is sharing. One of the innate things that drive us is like curiosity. It's learning. It's finding out why this doesn't do this. That is what a hacker is. It's like it is basically taking a three-year-old and having the educational system, the parental units and everything not destroy that curiosity and then that's how they stay hackers. Because we were all born hackers. When you were three years old, remember? Well, I don't, but you know, remember? Hey, why is that that way? What, what, why? Who's that? What, what does that do? Why? Why? Why is that? You remember? It's like, yeah, you, you've been around three-year-olds. It's like, or me. It's like, you understand. It's that innate curiosity that we have that makes us hackers. But the underrated thing in hacking is sharing. Sharing is caring. Too many people in this industry, it's like, want to get up and give a talk. And so it becomes like this narrow, like, field of, like, all these different people that speak at conferences. Right? When there's so many other people in the audience that have information to share, that have natural inclinations and have learned things and gone through a path and could share that to the community and to the world, but don't because no one wants to hear it or no one uh, would be interested or it's been talked about before. So we talk ourselves out of sharing and this community more, needs more sharing from a more diverse voices. It's like we need diversity is what makes everything in our, our community work. Because you can't, and we've learned that in hacking, you can't just say this is the same subset of rules. I'm sure that's enough. You need more information. You need more data. We need more people to contribute. So I think that is the most underrated thing in hacking right now is sharing. Yes. Okay. I have um, two questions, sort of uh, long questions. The first one is that there's a famous video of a guy going inside a bank and stealing a CPU from the bank in a physical engagement. Is that you? Like, d do you do physical or social engineering engagements? Uh, about robbing a bank? Yes, I've taken laptops out of banks and, and stuff, but. Okay, so it's you. The second question is, uh, I think I'm decent behind the keyboard, but like doing physical stuff, social engineering stuff right. is really hard for me and it scares me to, to be honest. What, what is happening in your mind when you are about to enter a bank with the idea that you are going to steal from them? Like what, what is going on there? How, how are you able to do that? Oh, um, well, first off, uh, right be uh, the question was like, you know, what do I do right before I, I start a physical uh, pen test? It's like, uh, I freak the f out. I mean, if I have horrible imposter syndrome and low self-esteem, it's like, what if this is the time where I get caught right off the bat, the test fails, and everybody's going to be like, yeah, I knew he was a fraud. Duh. It's like, you know, it's like, or I didn't do enough for my client. I'm like, now they're not going to want me to, to work for them ever again. They're going to talk about how bad I was at doing the job. They're not, they're going to lose what I was trying to do. It's like, so that's the first thing I do. I freak out. And it's like, and I have like nervous, I was like nervous right before stage. It's like, you know, because it's like, 
yeah, I'm going to have, I know people are going to be walking out. It's like, because this is not a, an exciting talk. It's like, but yeah, and that's cool because then I have that moment afterwards and I realize it's not about me. It's not about me trying to break into the client or trying to show them how I could pwn them. It's about the client being able to be better secured because of what I'm doing. We have this myth that red teamers are rock stars or some kind of like special little subgroup of people that are like so awesome and, and break things. Uh, the only reason why the red team exists is to make the blue team better. And if you're not doing that in your job and thinking about being an advocate instead of an adversary to the people who hired you, you failed. So that's what I start thinking about. It's like, look, it's not about me. It's like, whatever I do, they're going to learn from it. And every engagement that I go in now, I make sure I get caught. I deliberately make sure I get caught. And sometimes I don't have to try. It's like, uh, so, and that's the beauty of it. Because then, when you're doing a physical, you need to understand something. A server doesn't get upset when you pop them with MS0867 still, right? It's like, they don't get, to, it's a computer, it doesn't matter. When you tell someone, and you have to go back to someone and tell them that they shouldn't have let you in, they shouldn't have let you plug in that device to their computer, that's emotions. Those are people. They get upset. Will they lose their job? Are they going through a divorce at home? Are, are they going through bankruptcy? Are they afraid? What's, you don't know what day they're kind of having which is also the same for internet people, please. It's like, and so you don't know what they're going through, but you know what you're doing is to help them. And that is what you have to convey. It's like they shouldn't read that in a report three months from now, a memo saying they got uh, people let them in and, and uh, they have to work on their vulnerabilities. I always make sure I speak to every single person after the engagement. It's like after I have escaped, I talk to every single person and I personally tell them what happened, why it was bad, and then I explain to them this was not a test, okay? This was a uh, teaching. This was a teachable moment is what I call it. It's like you weren't, there's no loss, it was just a lesson. Your company wanted to make sure that you understood what these kind of attacks look like, so they sent me in. Now you know, now you'll do better. Uh, I have a second question. If yeah. If Okay, so the other question is, I'm relatively young and new to the industry and the hacking stuff, and I've seen that there's a lot, lot of people that maybe had internet access from the early days, and they think of themselves like the OGs of hacking, and I've seen a lot of people in, on internet and forums like uh, sh shaming the new people because uh, before the times were oh, harder yeah. and better, and honestly, I think that's bullshit. And a lot of all people in the industry and the, in the scene has this attitude. So what is your take on, on that oh stuff? Lord. Because even us beginners, we, we are trying. Like Things are different now, but we are doing this with passion. Right, yeah. My, uh, my take on that is, you know, he's talking about gatekeepers. He's talking about, like, like, what do we do about the gatekeepers? It's like, we're effing hackers. Screw the gate, jump the fence. Go under it, circumvent it. We don't have to be stopped. What you get is a whole bunch of awkward people who don't know how to deal with things, but they've got this one little skill and they think they're the, I'm the best at this. So it's up to me to be the horrible person other people were to me when I was starting up because that's the way it is. And like, I'm like, no, there's, I am literally not the only one in this conference that can give a couple of talks. And that what I mean by that, I mean all of you. There is no people going and saying, oh, have, do you, I don't know how to program. I can't program myself out of a plastic bag. It's like I try to teach my, teach my youngest child how to code with Python with the no starch book, you know, hacking with Minecraft and Python. Yeah, I got, chapter two almost, and I was like, yeah, you're on your own, kid. You, you, you work with that, it's like, I'm sure that'll work. It's like, so, I mean, it's not my skill. 
That doesn't make me stupid. That means I'm just ignorant of those things. And ignorance is not a bad word. Willful ignorance is bad. But being ignorant of something and wanting to learn something is not a bad thing. It's like we constantly have so many people telling us what we can't do. But the loudest voice that we hear in our heads is ourselves agreeing with them, trying to find out all the reasons why we can't talk, why we shouldn't share, why we can't do something. Screw that voice too. It's like, so don't let people say, oh, and most of them are like afraid. It's like you start challenging those. It's just like any bully that you see in school. It's like, it's just cowardice. They're afraid of losing their status. They're afraid of losing their credentials. They're afraid of losing their standing where we're like, I'm the big guy. I'm afraid that someone else is going to come in and be better than me. Too bad. And what I was saying before about diversity, it's like, you, the, it's horrible. It's like because they want to limit people who they don't think belong, who they don't think should be somewhere. And I'm sorry, but that never works out for anybody. It's like everybody is welcome here. And I gave a rant uh, a long time ago at, uh, I think it was like, Two decades ago or so, uh, it, was, it was 2019 at LAHAC where I talked more about that. So don't let them say you can't be somewhere. Trust me, I never let that stop me when I'm going into a bank. But it's like, but do that. It's like understand you can do what you want to do, but don't let reality get in the way of you trying to accomplish it. Okay, I'm a high school dropout who used to live behind a dumpster. It's like, and I'm on stage, and for some reason, people want to hear what I'm saying. That's not realistically something that's supposed to happen. I just don't care. So there you go. Thank you. Uh, there's one over here, and I'm just seeing how I see it. And also, it's funny to make the, the guys with the mics walk around. Yeah, raise your hand. There we go. We're going to be like, by the time this... This whole thing is over. There's going to be like 20 people with mics just milling in the audience. Okay, thank you. So I have a question. Yes. Uh, how did you manage the lack of motivation? Uh, personally, I, uh, when I have lack of, motiv of motivation, I uh, listen to some Darknet Diaries or I see some Disrupt TV. How did you do the lack of, moti of motivation for learning in cybersecurity of making just stuff? Uh, how do I further my education or how do I get... I uh, or how did you get over the, the lack of motivation of learning? If you have uh, any time a, a lack of, moti of motivation. Lack of... I'm sorry, I'm of American. Mo motivation. Texan, motivation. So Also, I was in a car accident recently, uh, last year, and it's like I'm also partially deaf, so you have to speak up. And yeah, it's talking about how do you deal with lack of motivation? Oh, lack of motivation. Oh, my gosh. Uh, especially the last couple of years, uh, I have been a mess. It's like uh, I can't give good advice on that. I don't know how. Uh, it's, uh, I've had problems. I've literally, I was in Berlin. In, uh, in, in the end of January of this year, giving a talk, and I've been like really depressed with you know my whole work situation and what's been going on, and some other situations that are going. And I was, and I love Berlin. It's like it's a beautiful city. It's like it's full of history. It's got like a lot of great architecture and the urban art. That's what I love. I love the graffiti. I love going to cities and seeing. It's like uh, France. I mean, Paris knows about that. Y'all have some amazing uh, street art here, and. And I could have done some more walking. There were some places I wanted to go. I spent two days just in my room. I could barely get out of, out, out of bed. It's like I just wasn't motivated. I just couldn't do it. It's like, and so depression sucks, but it's like we, we have problems in our, I mean, a lot of people are neurodivergent in this industry and in this community. It's like it makes us better. It's like it makes us different. It's like that's all. It just makes us different. And so... Uh, I've been more open about mine, so other people will realize it's not a bad thing. Uh, but 
when it hits, it's like you just try to remind yourself. I have notifications and I have notes that, that come up that tell me it's like this needs to get done. It's like when I have that certain time frame, it's like it helps my executive dysfunction disorder say, you know, oh, this has to be done now. So when you're, when you're losing that motivation, it's like it's hard to convince yourself to keep going. And that's why you need that external source. You need something else to like show you like, okay, no, you need to do this. And I'm a hypocrite if I say that it, it always works, because it doesn't. It's like, but that's the best thing, but that's the best thing I can offer. It's like, so when you lose that motivation, when you're working on a project and the, the, the exploit keeps failing, it's like, it doesn't matter. It's like, you're trying it and you're trying to do something. And the effort is what counts, not the result. Because there's a lot of people who say, oh, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do that and don't. So even if you failed, you still are more successful than half the people that want to do it, but don't. Okay, thank you. Yes. Oh, there's someone right down here. But just one second. Uh, they're wondering about red team engagements. A code of ethics. Oh, that's a very good point, because there are some people that have ethic problems in this community that are social engineers. Um, but I would say, yes, I do have a code of ethics. It's like, and one of the key things uh, for any, and this goes to any uh, engagement. It's like, in, in life, it's like, it's very simple. It's like, I do not harm people. I tried to do no harm. And what that means is, I do not send phishing emails out in the middle of an apocalypse telling people they're going to get a bonus. It's like as a company email. I don't send an email out to my employees to tell them that there's a free vaccine in February of 2021 and they need to register and sign up. That is, and I don't cuss very often, but please understand, that is fucking disgusting. Because you know what? You may not have had a lot of insider threats in your institution or your company. But after that email, I guarantee you do. When you want to give an employee a teachable moment, you can do a demo and show them how bad those phishing emails can get. Never sending to the employees, but using it in a company-wide talk. I've done a talk on phishing emails and what I do and how I use those. And every example I use is horrible. I used the murder of two young girls as a phishing pretext. I never sent it. I showed them. And you're thinking like, that is horrible. Mother, I'm trying to rob you. What part of criminal do you not understand? Because that's what criminals do. If you don't think that there are a dozen or more Red Crescent sites set up right now to aid the earthquake in Afghanistan, you'd be sorely mistaken. It's like after every single major disaster, before the help gets there, there's someone setting up a website to get money off of it. You do not stoop down to the criminal's level to teach that lesson to the employee. You do no harm. So you have to make choices. How bad am I gonna lie? How way am I gonna circumvent? What am I gonna take? And it's like, and I've literally, I've felt horrible sometimes on these engagements. I told the Mother Teresa of Jamaica, who was the head of a charity organization in Jamaica, I told her I was putting them on television, that I was a TV producer, and I wanted to show them the, uh, one of the episodes we'd already filmed on my USB stick. I didn't directly show it to her, because that way I'm not too evil, uh, but I showed it to uh, the, uh, the main guy of the organization. That is effing horrible. Remember I told you that I always go back after two minutes and go and talk to each person? The only time that did not occur 
was on that engagement. I literally was like legit, like I called the guy up and I was like, um, um, yeah, you can't make me go back in. Uh, I'm not going in. I'm not doing it. It's like, I'm sorry. It's like, I've never said I was professional. I can't go back and tell those people what I did. So you need to let them know. Uh, thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was a little awkward. It's like, and I still feel bad about that. But it helped the company learn. I did not harm them in doing this. So that's the main thing. It's like, do no harm. Uh, oh, yes, one more, and then, and then I'll start looking up that way, but yes. Um, hi. Um, my first question is, uh, I think, very important, but uh, um, it's how are you? You talk about uh, two uh, hard years because of COVID and all, all those stuff. Uh, my first question is, how are you? And the second is um, uh, linked to your prof professional activity. Uh, what is the fail that caused you the biggest shame uh, professionally, uh, I mean? Okay, the first question was how am I? Oh, I'm doing better now. Uh, I was a train wreck. Uh, it's like whatever I share on, on, on social media is like one-tenth of what is actually going on. Uh, but it's like I try to make statements. I try to be honest with myself. And people don't realize I don't use Twitter as social media. That's my mother from live journal. That is what I use to remind myself because I am constantly, my whole room, they, everybody sees my lab, they see how chaotic it is and it's full of all these things. Those are memories because I have a soundtrack in the back of my head constantly telling me how worthless I am and how little I've done and that I can't do anything. So I use those things as visual reminders and cues to like go, no, I've done that, that is cool. It's like, so it's like I use that as a visual reminder. So uh, I'm doing better though now. So I am doing better. It's like, it's been rough. It's like, I'm starting to find some positivity and it's like, I'm tr and that's the reason why I'm starting to tweet more. It's like, you're seeing more of the pictures of the Hacker Adventures. I had a backlog of two months of Hacker Adventure pictures because quite honestly, I was just, I was not feeling it. It's like, that's a lie. Cause I was being happy on the picture for social media for the A-roll when in actuality, I was doing it because, well, I need to do it. People want to see it. It's like, and I wasn't doing it for me. So I didn't feel really at the moment to feel like tweeting it out. But I'm now getting back to a better place where I'm like, okay, I want to tweet. I want to share this. I want people to see uh, the places I go because I go to some weird places and do some weird things. So uh, that's what I'm doing now. And the, the second uh, question was, Oh, how do, how do I do the, uh, how do I stay productive? How do I, I work functionally in, in the work? Uh, no, my second question is about uh, your biggest fail. Uh, what is the biggest fail that uh, caused you uh, the shame sentiment? Oh, the biggest fail that caused me the biggest shame? Yes. Oh, yes, yes. oh my gosh, yes, I, I know, I got that one down. Um, some people in here might have heard about uh, Darknet Diaries episode six, right? you do realize that is my biggest, biggest fail. Do you know how bad you have to suck to like not only just go out of scope a little bit, but effing go into the wrong bank, don't even pay attention to where you're at just because you got to pee and you rob people that weren't asking for it? That was a mistake. That was wrong. That was, and the, the best part about it is that everybody thinks it's so cool, so everybody brings it up. Yeah, I heard your dozer. Yeah, uh-huh, it was a good one. Yeah, I screwed up on that one, didn't I? Just because I got away with it makes it cool. Just because it looks like, you know, I got to rob a bank. It's like, that sounds cool. But when you look at the underlying stuff and you start to think about it, which it took me a while to start actually thinking about it, I realized how badly I failed. And it's like, and how badly I need to do better. So now I always make sure I go to the restroom before I start trying to, to rob a place. And I also make sure I pay attention to make sure it's the right place. I, I know of another person who uh, did tone loc, yes, I'm old, uh, to a whole region in another country. That was bad. That was an F up. That wasn't like, ha oh, I got the war drive, you know, half of Brazil. That was a screw up. Those things sound cool, 
except for when you realize the person who did it shouldn't have done it, didn't want to do it, and feel bad about it. I actually met up with the, uh, the guy who was the head of security for the Accidental Bank uh, in Dubai, and we just, we had a laugh. It's like, because his responses were amazing. They had a great blue team that like responded once they realized what was going on, and they didn't arrest me. It's like, I mean, it took me about three or four hours to get to that point, but they were willing to listen. They were willing to take the data, and they were willing to make that decision, not just because their feelings were hurt or they felt bad that I'd gone in there and, and did these things. So uh, that is uh, probably uh, my biggest fail. Another question? Oh, there's a question right there. Sorry. Uh, raise your hand again. It's a race. Okay. She wins. So uh, what is your best experience? My best what? Experience. Silence? <laughs> experience. Experience. My best experience. Um, professionally or uh, personally? Professionally, uh, my best experience was in January of 2020, uh, in the before times. Uh, it's like I was doing a, uh, a, a breach of a client that I had robbed, success, I mean, like way more successfully the year before. And I mean, I, the guy who contacted us and like would contract us to do the job, literally, uh, he goes to his desk to find me sitting in it, using another employee's badge, real badge, that I stole off their desk after I found a way to get into the, the suite that I was told had never been breached before. No one usually gets out of the lobby. And, and that's why I always say, never go through the lobby. I love freight elevators. It's like, and so, and so I show them that, and I freaked them the, out. But you know what they did? They didn't make excuses. They didn't like feel bad. They didn't argue. They learned. They learned from those mistakes. The CEO of the company, during his company-wide meeting, where he pays for everybody to come to this meeting, literally said, we need to do better about security awareness. This is what needs to be done. This stuff is important for that year. So 2019, they did better at security awareness. They did better at teaching their users. And you know what happened when I came in 2020? Run into a receptionist, never met me before. It's not like, oh, they knew who you were. Nope. They wanted it to work. They wanted to see the truth. Receptionist, you ain't getting in. It's like, because I tried to walk in like I knew where, where I was going, because I didn't know where I was going. I'd been there before. It's like, she stopped me. She wasn't having it. So I had to sign in and tell me who I was meeting. So she gives me a small little temporary badge. And then, of course, as always, Oh, I need to go to the restroom. This time it's malicious. It's like, I'm like, I need to go to the restroom. So she lets me into the secure area, and instead of going left to the men's room, I turn right down the corridor. Plug the first machine, uh, plug it into the first machine, I'm golden. It's like, plug it into a second one, yay. Lady in an office with a glass, you know, wall, looks up, stands up, and just stares at me. Because she knows something is up. So I'm about to like, okay, I need to go back. The person who was uh, responsible for me, not, not that I am, but it's like the person who was responsible for me at the time, he uh, comes over to greet me. And he's like, yeah, dude. It's like the receptionist had already contacted me to let you know that you did not go because there's a small camera showing that hallway and showed that you didn't go into the restroom. So she already notified me. And I was like, that is effing amazing. Every department that I went into on that engagement I got caught. I had successful on uh, mostly every section too. Th that doesn't matter. That's just human nature. But at every single department, I was legitimately caught. Uh, I don't know if you're not from help desk, and it's like, and I need to contact help desk before I can let you do anything with my computer. I wasn't aware of this. Can you show me the email? It's not going to happen. It was amazing. That was the most successful job I've ever done in my life. That was the most amazing thing, was I kept getting caught. They were paying attention. They learned from what happened in the before, 
and they started getting better. And it doesn't matter that I was successful in other sections. You know why? Because screw this whole we're never getting breached thing, okay? I don't know what that is. It's not we're never getting breached. What keeps a company solvent is how quickly can you detect the breach? How quickly do you react to it? That is the deciding factor of a company nowadays. It's not preventing it. You know, I think we've learned you can't build walls, make the APT pay for it, and think you're going to be secure. That just doesn't work. How quickly can you detect when something happens and respond? So with all those other people that caught me, even though I was successful, they still were able to manage the breach. They learned in five minutes that something had been plugged in, something bad was on the network, then five months later or a year later when they read it on, on the website, it's like a new site, and their CEOs are telling them that it's like, you know, APT. Yes. Uh, the blue shirt hand was up like lightning, so. I'll, I'll get you right next, and there's someone over there. Yes, I'll get you next, uh, after them. Um, um, what are your advice for a new buy hacking enthusiast? What's my advice for uh, noob hackers, people yeah. just starting out? Um, my best advice is uh, to stop believing yourself. It's like, it's like a lot of people, it's like, oh, you got to believe in yourself. It's like, no, I don't believe in myself. It's like my self tells me horrible things. Stop believing what your voice says in the back of your head. Just start understanding, contribute, learn, and share. It's like learn and share. It's like learn and share how you failed. Share, I did a whole talk one year on nothing but my failures. Like not the really cool failures, you know, where like, oh, I left an orange out and discovered penicillin. No, like don't ever do this Titanic proportions, right? It's like, so just don't try to listen to the stuff that you're saying and the roadblocks you put up. Just keep learning and understand you are not alone. Everybody wants to be that special snowflake in the special snowflake blizzard, people. I'm sorry. Okay? That's not, that's not going to work. No matter how many black hoodies you see, you know, it's like, and how many people you see with all the cool stickers, we're all the same. We're all trying to do better. We're all trying to learn. And we're all needing to share information to others to help them out. Yes. Oh, wait, no, I, I'm sorry. It was this person next and then that person over there. But yes, just one second. Yes. Okay, I have a question. I will just want to call back for what you said about don't limit yourself. But sometimes uh, you face of gender bias or race bias. So you can have uh, some voice in your head, don't limit yourself, but it depends on the environment that where you work. I have a question, how you, you deal for your own bias? Because I know that bias can often make me take the bad decision in work. How do you do deal with that, for your own bias? Yeah, uh, bias sucks. Uh, it doesn't suck. Uh, as much for me, because I'm a white guy. It's like, let's be honest. It's like, expectations for me are lower. It's like, in this thing. Being a woman, being female presenting in, in, in this environment, sucks majorly. Each person in here, each woman in here, has had to do 10 times more than their counterpart to make it here. Because they had to face that bias every day. It's like people of color, especially in America, have to, it's not something that they can take the black hoodie off and don't be seen as a hacker. That is something that they are born with and have to deal with every single day that they shouldn't. Our community, like what I was talking about was diversity. That's exactly what's going to save this industry. And I, I think a lot of other things we need to understand that we are just meat robots. I am nothing but a meat robot. I am a consciousness 
that is going around and I use these things and I use my external uh, meat robotic, organic robotic body to take me to the places and, and tell, say what I want to do. That's my consciousness. My meat robot has nothing to do with what knowledge I share. It doesn't have anything to do with what I'm trying to do. It's like, I don't care what uh, your paint job is on your meat robot. I don't care if you decide to later to change the equipment on your meat robot. I don't care who you decide to couple with, it's like with your meat robot. That doesn't matter. What do you know and what can you share? So you are going, I, and I can't tell you, anything. I'm not going to, sorry, can't lie. I can't say, oh, it's going to get better. It's like, not just yet, until we get more people who are already facing that burden, speak out more and start motivating. There are a lot of great people on Twitter. There's a lot of great people in this society and in our community that are being louder. They're not knowing their place. They're speaking up. And a lot of people hate it. And I'm here for it with popcorn. It's like one of the best advice that I give people when they're trying to do new job interviews, it's like I have people come up to me, it's like, and a woman comes like, well, I don't know, how, what do I do when I do a job interview? Because I am start analyzing all the requirements and I don't meet all those. And I'm like, girl, please, okay? You know what you need to do? You need to channel your inner mediocre white dude, okay? That's what you need to do. Because I'm a mediocre white dude. Anytime I go to a job interview and somebody tells me like something, I don't know it, I'm like, yeah, I don't know it just right, but I, I will because I'm really good at Google. It's like, and I'm a sharp learner and I can, I can perform. They're like, well, do you know uh, this thing? It's like, well, give me a second. It's like, oh, but it says that you're not familiar with this protocol. You know what? Your company is and you hire me. I get to learn it the way that you do it. So many people of color, so many women look at a job resume, uh, a, a, a job posting, and they go, oh, I don't know that very well. Or I don't know that very Girl, you don't even have to wait for the gatekeeper. You're doing it for yourself. It's like, what's the harm in asking? What's the harm in trying? Because there's a lot of harm about not doing nothing. And we also need, in this community, a lot of mediocre white dudes to stand up and lend and amplify their voices to those people. We need a lot more of those people who are comfortable speaking up. It's like, it, it, trust, I don't want to go, it gets, I'm very, it's a very touchy subject with me. It's like, because, you know, we don't need allies that just talk and share something like, and try to be like, you know, positive on the internet. But look, we need them now standing up when it's unpopular. Standing up when it's got, they got something to risk. Because you know what? Every single person they're trying to help always has had to risk that. And that is what we need to start doing. It's like if you don't think you, if you want to know what living on the edge is like, living with risk, being dangerous, try to think of a person of color walking down a street in Houston, Texas. Takes more courage than I've got. I don't have to fear when I get pulled over by the police, usually. Sometimes I get scared because I'm pretty sketchy. But I don't have to do that. And because it's outside of my realm of possibility, I forget how hard it is. Because everything's great for me. I can go to a party at a hacker uh, conference, and I don't have to worry about my drinks getting roofied. I don't have to uh, worry if someone's following me to my hotel room. I don't have to make sure that I have contingencies and people that will check up on me through the night or the night after or the morning after to make sure I'm still alive. I don't deal with that. That's out of my realm of possibility. And it is an everyday occurrence
to those people it applies to. And we don't like thinking about those things because those things are not cool. Those things are not happy-go-lucky stuff. And that is the reason why they're still having to deal with that in silence, and we're trying to turn a blind eye to it. Wow, that really brought the room down. Yes? Yes. Uh, is it working? No. Yes? Okay. Uh, it's not as a big question as the previous one, so oh, sorry for that. <laughs> Uh, how did you deal with your family? Uh, all this, we all think about all this ta the time spent on computers, trying to learn, to, to read books. How did you deal uh, with your family time? Uh, how, do you, how, do you, how did you manage that? Uh, not very well. Um, <laughs> I tell people, people are like, say, I'm so good at something. I'm like, yeah, because I'm a horrible husband and a lousy father. It's like it helps. Uh, it's like... The, the key thing is, uh, and my thing is different. It's like, because I come from a lot of childhood trauma. I've come through a lot of, I literally thought for like the first five, 10 years that I, tra I was traveling and doing, I thought the more time I was away from my family, the better it would be because I was such a horrible father and I was such a horrible influence that they didn't need me to be there. Uh, I started uh, in 2021, I started taking uh, medication for my ADHD. I started realizing it's like, you know, and embracing the part that I'm on the spectrum and, and I don't need the mask so much. And I started realizing I can be good enough. And so I've started carving out family time. It's like, so that's a good thing. It's like uh, my, also my uh, relationship and my uh, uh, personal stuff is way more diverse and, and, and different than most cookie cutter normal families are. So it's like, and I'm okay with that too, and everybody's okay with that, but that's just the way it is. But I'm still trying to be better as a human, which means being better at someone that's interacting with those people, because children are not your property. Children are not what you own. They're ones that you've been bestowed responsibility for, for the first 18 years, 20 years of their life. So they can make changes that you don't like. They can do things that they don't like. My youngest child has decided to change their name. And I was like, I'm all here for it. Would you like me to start calling you that? Or would you like to just wait and say, no, no, you can keep calling me this, but I want to get it legally changed. And I was like, That's exactly what you should do. Because you know why? I didn't know you when you were born. Why do you get to be stuck with the name that I gave you without even knowing you sight unseen. It's like, so you choose the name that represents you because you should know you and that should be your name. And that is exactly the way it is. It is not my job to keep them in this little mold that I have of what it was. And I've gone and I've struggled with it. I have struggled with like some of the things like, oh, oh, oh they're thinking about doing that or thinking about, it's not about me. I should be there for them. I should be helping them as they go along and down this path. I shouldn't be another roadblock they have to overcome. All right, next question. I don't know how much longer. I don't even have a watch. I don't have notes. I'm just running until they kick me off. Oh, oh, is it done? Okay, good. It's like, uh, it's like I, I did not, I literally did not know what time it was, so I apologize. I have one last question. <laughs> Just a quick one. As um, a good hacker, it's like, you know, I know you said this, but let's do this. Uh, so, uh, it was just, um, what is your biggest regret related to your hacker's life? Oh, uh, I, I'm going to need that replayed. Uh, uh, wh what uh, is your biggest regret? My biggest regret? Yes, related to how you, your hacker's life. Um, my biggest regret is not being honest uh, with myself. Um, I've been, I've been um, when I was very young, it's like, uh, I'm old, okay? So when I was young and people were on the spectrum, they were just rambunctious, they were wild, they were like not controllable, they were bad things. And I had a very abusive uh, childhood with uh, a, a mother that was like, you know, the worst. Um, and 
I learned to mask back then. I learned how to read body language. I learned how to uh, show and try to be what people were expecting of me so I would not, you know, so I could still live. It's like, and suffered less damage. It's like, so I did that. And I then got so caught up in that that I just started masking all the time. And I stopped trying to be what I thought everybody wanted Jason to be. So, in, uh, and I mean, and, and trust me, you ain't seeing Jason right now. That's a train wreck. You're seeing Jason E. Street. Whenever you see me with all this jewelry on, this is my costume that gives me enough confidence to get on this stage and say these things. I would not be here. I literally am masking right now just so I can perform. It's like, and when, and trust me, I think this is a performance, you know, but it's like, but also hopefully something educational. I like to be entertaining as you learn. But my biggest regret is not doing it, sir. It wasn't until 2021 that I allowed myself to stop masking. I allowed myself to be normal in the way that I should be when I'm not on stage, when I'm not at a conference. And it freaks people the, out. It freaks me out sometimes. It's like I have certain tics that I do. It's like I'll repeat words or there'll be like a big pause, long, awkward silence because I'm trying to process. It's like um, I'm still halfway in character, uh, halfway in character, but it's like I, I do this hand thing that's very annoying sometimes, and I talk out loud more than I used to. I verbalize more. It's like so. Um, it, it is definitely different, but that is my biggest regret because I did not allow myself to be me, because I had to uh, please the expectations of other people, and uh, that's the same thing that with my work life too. That's what makes me so good at social engineering. I've never trained professionally for social engineering. It's like I was, that's all based off of some really great childhood trauma that, that gave me some great lessons. So my biggest regret was not being me sooner.